So you've done a lot of work on serotonin and its receptors and the genes that influence mm -hmm. it. Can we talk a little bit about how evolution shaped all of those systems? Does evolution shape different hormones and different receptors all at the same time? How, mm -hmm. do, how does it go in sequence of evolution? Well, one way to think about that is that there are actually relatively few hormones. You can count them on the fingers of two hands, uh, almost. Uh, but there are many, many different effects that each of those hormones can have, uh, which immediately tells you that it is not a property of the hormone itself that causes the effect, but it's how that hormone is interacting with the receiving cell. So you start off, say, with three different receptors for serotonin, and then you have mutations mm -hmm. not in the thing that makes the serotonin, but in the receptors. Precisely. So it's either in the receptor or in the molecules that are activated by the receptor. Because when, when a hormone binds to a, a receptor on a cell, it causes the activation of other molecules inside the cell. And those can be different in different cells. Mm -hmm. And so, and, 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 and which of those downstream pathways is turned on depends on what genes a particular cell so has So you can have different on. kinds of cells with different receptors for serotonin in them, and even beyond that, it sounds like even within two cells that have the same kind of receptor, if they're different kind of cells, they might do different things. They might still do different things because the downstream pathway is different. So this isn't simple complexity, this is complex complexity. This is layer upon layer, and, and this is where evolution comes in. Uh, how, how does evolution come in? Well, the, the first steps in, in, in sort of the evolution of, of signaling, it's really very difficult to, to, to detect. I mean, we know how things operate as, ex, as they exist today, but how does a cell decide that it wants to become a responder to a hormone? Uh -huh. Okay. Now, every cell has in its genome all the receptors for ready, the Ready to go that, if that they exists, decide to make them. Right. If they decide to make them. Right. Okay. So any cell, if, it, if, if there is some selective pressure for that cell to be able to respond to a hormone under some circumstances, then it can express that receptor, put it in the cell membrane, um, and have some response to it. And what evolution would then do is to gradually refine that downstream pathway to optimize the response that the so cell So does it give an advantage and that individual has more offspring or does it give a disadvantage and less offspring? For instance. And that's going to influence yeah, for whether, instance. whether that mutation creating that receptor in that place with that downstream effect sticks yeah. or goes If it away. was a good idea for the cell to have a receptor on so it increases the fitness of its bearer, so to speak, then that mutation, that, or that, that, that property would persist from generation to generation. And so I'd like to go back to gene four again for just a minute and why that's such a mistake. Um, the advertisements all say that depression is a disease of lack of serotonin. We know that's not the case because if you mm -hmm. give people an antidepressant, their serotonin levels go up within hours and the depression doesn't get better for exactly. weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's something about influences on those other 20 receptors or so and how they all interact with each other. Can your approach possibly help psychopharmacologists and researchers figure out new strategies for what's mm -hmm. actually the mechanism of these drugs given their beneficial effects. Well, that is exactly some one of the research programs that we have going on. So as, as you know, we uh, built mathematical models of these metabolic systems like serotonin signaling and serotonin reuptake and serotonin metabolism. And um, one of the, the, one of the uh, components of that model is how serotonin reuptake inhibitors affect the rate at which serotonin is, re is taken up from the synaptic cleft. So I've given different medications to different drugs mm -hmm. for decades, mm -hmm. and we all talk about slight differences. Do they really do anything different in terms of their action on serotonin reuptake, or are they all pretty much the same? Uh, they are all pretty much the same as far as we know. They are quantitatively different. In other words, some of them might be more slightly, produce slightly higher rates of reuptake or slightly lower. Mm -hmm. lower rates of reuptake. But where the real differences lie is in what all the other components of the serotonin signaling system are doing in that particular individual. And those are likely to be influenced by all kinds of genetic variations and environmental variations and what they eat and everything. Absolutely. And we know that from genomic studies and from gene association studies that each of the enzymes and transporters in a serotonin uh, metabolic system has dozens of alleles or dozens of mutations that occur. So some people are trying very hard to figure out which people with which genes are going to get better with these drugs and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. And so there are little hints that that might work, but not very strong. Uh, not very strong, and, and the way we are approaching that is uh, we can, again, using these mathematical models, we can examine which combinations of genetic variants in the serotonin signaling system make 
a better, give you a better response to the serotonin reuptake. So there inhibitor. might be a way of doing that. So let's go on in just a moment and talk about what good are mathematical models.